Good morning, good afternoon, good evening on behalf of GPAC, the Global Partnership for Prevention of Armed Conflict, and welcome to our third day of online training on multi-stakeholder processes for human security. GPAC is the Global Partnership for Prevention of Armed Conflict, founded in 2003, but launched in 2005 at the UN, a member-led network of civil society organizations working on conflict prevention and peace building across the world, working specifically with civil society. We promote a global shift in peace building in how the armed conflict is dealt with, working on a shift from reaction to prevention and again, specifically, we work with the concept of human security. Uh, this is a map showing how GPAC is, is really global. We have 15 different regional networks from Northeast Asia to Latin America, to Central America, to Africa, to the Middle East, uh, North Africa region where I'm based. And we also have working groups as vertical structures cutting across all the regions, a um, peace education working group, policy and advocacy working group, gender focal points, again, in all the regions and youth focal points in the regions. And this uh, webinar is organized by the Improving Practice Working Group. I think we have an explanation about that, yes which uh, aim to improve the way conflict prevention and peace building are done in practice based on the principles of human security and on a multi-stakeholder approach. Today is the third online training and this is the third day of this training. And here's a photograph of our group in Vienna from two years ago. Our presenter today is John Rudy under the blue umbrella and we have as you can see people from everywhere in that uh, happy picture john rudy is a, who will give the presentation today is a global educator on topics of human security peace building conflict transformation and nonviolence. he has more than 35 years of work in 30 countries in asia and africa and has focused his efforts at transforming conflict and community and middle out leadership. His recent training energies have gone towards human security and civil society. He will soon be teaching a five week course on peace education with the Mindanao Peace Building Institute. I think maybe he can put the information for you in the chat. John will give a recap of the past two days and then today he will be giving a presentation on um, civilian peacekeeping. What he will do, the format will be that he will give the presentation. Then we'll invite questions and discussion, and then he will come to a case study. So please uh, go ahead, John, and welcome everyone. Thanks, Lucy. Um, let me get my participants and my chat set up here now that I'm sharing screen and it's good to see some of you back again today. Um, I'm going to uh, do a brief overview just to remind us of the things that we have um, we've already covered and uh, to alert you to these resources the uh, GPAC multi-stakeholder processes for conflict prevention and peace building uh, manual freely available uh, at the link or if you uh, flash the QR code there. Also, I've been drawing a lot uh, these last two days and today on the multi-stakeholder guide. They have their own um, website, mspguide.org. Again, freely downloadable. Uh, some other resources, videos, uh, and other ways to use their multi-stakeholder guide. Again, to remind us, uh, the first day we uh, took a look at designing an MSP, uh, yesterday facilitating. Today we're gonna look a little bit at leadership and then we'll do a protection of civilian case study. We had hoped that uh, Fiji would give us a case study, Adibasu, 
one of our members, uh, but she fell ill and so is not able to be with us today. The human security definition um, of, uh, sorry, the UN definition of human security, freedom from fear, freedom from want, and freedom to live in dignity. And um, when we design an MSP, then we're looking specifically, uh, we, have, we have three approaches to this. We can look at it problem-oriented, conflict-oriented, or opportunity-oriented. And um, it really makes a difference how you approach the MSP. If you're opportunity focused, uh, it's much less crisis oriented than perhaps uh, problem or conflict orientation might be. And so um, the kind of leadership, which we'll talk a little bit about today, uh, may differ in those cases. Um, we always want to do an assessment of the resources we bring to an MSP, and we always want to look for the gaps that uh, develop in designing these multi-stakeholder processes. Um, what's missing? Who's missing? Is there a major sector uh, that could be included to enhance the work of the MSP? And then um, the planning cycle, the adaptive planning, the collaborative action, reflective monitoring, um, there's a, a synergy that happens when you begin to operationalize an MSP. Again, we looked at some of the various facilitation skills yesterday that might be needed during uh, an MSP, and all groups kind of go through phases of uh, coming together, of discovering differences, uh, of potentially flying apart, um, but, but good leadership can, can help it move to co-creation, conversions, and commitment stages. Today, I want to ask you this question. Look at this picture and ask yourself, what can you say about leadership in this picture? You can either put a response in the chat or you could, um, it's, it's up to you. Um, oops, I just stopped sharing my screen. Sorry about that, folks. Um, I meant to move my chat over. <clears throat> yeah. Having more technical problems today than I've had all week. Um, so in this picture, you may look at that and you may say, well, it's the blind leading the blind in this one. Or you might see how um, there's a group who are disconnected from the leader. The leader on the left there does not have a blindfold on. So it isn't the blind leading the blind. But because of that disconnection, it, uh, it becomes that, the blind leading the blind. Um, a question that comes to my mind is, how do we know we're not walking in circles if we're all blind? And uh, finally, there's a cultural artifact you can discern here. Uh, and maybe it's reading into this picture, maybe not. The man uh, in the blue shirt may have some hesitancies to touch the woman in front of him. And so there, that's how that disconnection uh, emerged. Whatever we can say about leadership um, from this picture, we, we'll just have to guess for now. This was taken in Laos in a training I did a number of years ago. Well, MSP, uh, there's a number of MSP principles, and this does come from that second guide that I, I uh, showed you. Um, one of those principles of designing and implementing an MSP is to promote collaborative leadership. And there are six areas of leadership um, and, and, and stages of leadership and different skills will be needed at different times. There's the convening leadership. When the group comes together, um, it's, it's the trust building, it's the, it's the leader who may actually draw various stakeholders into an MSP 
if they're a little bit hesitant to do so. There's constituency leaders. Everyone in the room around the table at an MSP may not have the same constituency support when they go back home. And so it's really important if someone is overextending themselves to an MS to, to come to a multi-stakeholder process that they have support when they go back to their own constituencies, lest they be kind of ejected. They cross the bridge to meet the other, but they can't go back home, so to speak. And so there's a leadership um, in various constituent groups that needs to be navigated during these times of, of coming together. There's supporting leadership. And this is often, um, comes from, and I think the case study yesterday from Serbia, um, you had to get the nod from certain um, political or local leadership. Uh, they may or may not be involved in the MSP, but their support is crucial in allowing the convening of these meetings. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's organizing leadership. Um, and you know it's the uh, it's the Christinas of the world for these. <laughs> Thank you, Christina, for all the organizing you've done behind the convening of this uh, training, this workshop on uh, on multi-stakeholder processes. Um, so you need the behind the scenes people who make sure the water and the snacks are there, who make sure the venue is booked, and those kinds of things. So. Um, so every MSP needs that behind the scene organizing leadership. Number five, the informing leadership. Um, there's a lot of information that may either leak out of an MSP. Uh, some cases they may want to be confidential, these multi-stakeholder processes. And yet uh, information may leak out, misinformation, fake news. And so uh, there's a kind of a leadership that's needed in um, in making sure that there's a enough transparency, enough uh, honest communication, so that there's no uh, there's no whispering about secrets and and uh, uh, but but that uh, there's a transparency uh, where it's appropriate. And then finally, of course, there's the facilitation leadership. This is what we explored yesterday. Uh, in the kinds of skills needed at various stages of uh, facilitating these groups. And there's dialogical and mediation. Um, there's uh, good listening skills. Those are the kinds of facilitated leadership skills that are needed. Another principle is participation. From this picture, what participation comparison can you make between the two pictures? We have participants doing outputs here, but what, what might be the differences here? Think for a minute about that. So perhaps you notice uh, that the, the one is holding a microphone. So um, that might indicate that the room is bigger, that the, 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 uh, the participant number is bigger. Um, we don't know who the, the picture on the right, who they're talking to, but there's a microphone which indicates uh, some kind of a, a bigger, more populated process. Uh, who has the floor? Now in the left picture, you can see that's me, if you don't recognize me. And I am facilitating the outputs of, of some group work versus on the right side. We don't know if the man with the microphone uh, is the facilitator or not, but we do see three people in there up front in front of their output. So maybe this is much more participatory kind of uh, output in, in a process. Um, are, the, are they being asked questions? Are they uh, just kind of lecturing about uh, what is on their diagrams and outputs? 
Um, but you will note in, in true and good workshop style, uh, we have a gallery style of output. Everybody's standing up who's presenting, which indicates that there's some kind of a formal give and take. Now on the left side, all the participants are standing. On the right side, only the presenters are standing. So these are some of the things um, um, that are representative in the next MSP principle, and that is fostering participatory learning. In a multi-stakeholder process, if one party, powerful party, dominates, then we have the potential for that process, that MSP being uh, not seen as le uh, legitimate. Um, so, so to develop a process whereby people learn from each other is one of the leadership skills of facilitating that process, of convening that, that process, the multi-stakeholder process. There's interactive learning, uh, very much more um, uh, right along the lines of learning from each other. Interactive learning, what kind of activities do we do to get to the point where we can learn from each other? One of, the, one of the things when you have very disparate groups and you're focusing on conflict is to do a conflict timeline. Uh, you want to do that in, in plenary, in groups, if you have multiple people from, from different kinds of groups. But the timelines are really help people to understand that, oh my goodness, there are many different kinds of perspectives in the room. And what, what you may have seen as one thing, someone sees as something else. So certainly limiting lectures uh, for uh, fostering participation. This is the challenge during COVID, right? In a workshop, how do you get participation with, uh, uh, in a Zoom, Zoom situation like this? Um, number four, uh, doing physical things in, in, a, in a workshop. Uh, sculpting, for example, uh, one of the when we do power in our workshops, we do body sculpting of power. How is power represented in our physical human bodies? Um, and certainly, drama, singing, and poetry gets us thinking from a different part of our brain uh, in working at um, sharing and learning from each other, in participating in the learning. Uh, and certainly in formal times, again, Tanya had an excellent example of that yesterday. Get people out of the, out of the convening room, out of the, behind the tables, uh, going out in the evening, seeing sites, uh, exploring um, their uh, surroundings, hearing each other's stories. Uh, this is where a lot of the bonding of groups can form. Now, um, transforming institutions is another one of these MSP principles. What can you see in this, these two pictures that would represent institutions? Well, we see what appears to be um, students in school uniforms. So we know the school is one of the institutions present here. Um, we might see the picture on the right and say, well, there's a flag that's being hoisted at school. So there's a kind of a respect that's being instituted in this school uh, for the nation state. And this happens to be in East Timor, Timor Leste. Um, we might say that the fact that there is a school represents uh, a kind of a value set, an institutionalized value set in this particular place. So uh, the fact that students are learning means that there's a value set that, that um, wants to see children uh, develop and thrive. On the left side, perhaps we might say, well, uh, where most of the students are either sitting on the floor or standing, there's an elderly person uh, on the left side there who has gotten a seat. And so we might be able to discern uh, some of the values, traditions, um, 
in this society that values uh, respect and honor for the elderly. And again, making some pretty big leaps of logic here and conclusions, but these are the skills that we, we need to uh, uh, develop as we are coming together in diversity around the multi-stakeholder table. And so um, this principle of transforming institutions and structures, uh, we need to find supporting institutions and we also need to identify the obstructing institutions. We've used the term spoilers with them before. Um, and um, so we need, to, we need to figure out who are allies and who, who those are obstructing us. We need to think about systems thinking. You know, it's not just one government agency who may be obstructing, but it's a whole system uh, that was working together and, and our multi-stakeholder process may be uh, working against um, a system and, it, and, and the spoiler happens to be just one actor, but it's a whole system. We need to think about institutional change. So, so how do institutions change? If they are opposing the kind of purpose and work that we're doing as a multi-stakeholder process, how might um, that institution change to become an ally? And then we finally need to think about cultural change. Are there cultural artifacts that are uh, prohibiting or, or um, uh, you know, thwarting the efforts of our multi-stakeholder process. Um, so I'm going to take a, a, a break now. Uh, that's the input I have for today. I, I wonder if there are any questions or any thoughts um, about the leadership of a multi-stakeholder process. You can unmute yourself. We're a small enough group if you have questions, or you can put them in the chat. Yeah, this is a really small group. So I, the idea was initially <laughs> to, to break into mm -hmm. breakout uh, groups, but this is the size of a breakout group. So you really have an opportunity here to ask John anything. I think maybe you've been here over the last two, three days. I know some people, I see some names. So it would be really your opportunity to ask John anything. He's uh, the most uh, expert trainer you will come across perhaps in, in this field. So please uh, make the most of the opportunity on anything from the last three days. Do you understand me? Do you hear me? Yes, no. go ahead. Hi. Hi. Well, um, good morning. I, I was wondering about um, if there is a, a conflict and a big disbalance in power. So um, how do you do that the minority group that has less power, how can you, how can you, how can I say that? How can you um, provide that their voice has more impact than they normally will have because they have so less power? Yeah, thank you, Jet. And Jet, can you tell me where you're from? Well, I'm from the Netherlands, but I live in Chiapas, Mexico, okay. where I work for a small international peace organization. Okay, thank you, Jet. Yeah, that's a great question, and I think Actually, the entire topic of the of the workshop here is 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 about power and balancing power. Um, why would we come together over some purpose if it wasn't to kind of enhance voices um, that that really don't have some kind of representation or power? And so, it's in the very multi-stakeholder process itself where you want to gain allies. And if, if, you, um, uh, if you're finding it difficult to have a voice, a cohesive group of, of stakeholders from various sectors who begin to take that issue on, uh, then, then certainly that voice is enhanced. The, the power, and whether it's political or social or even economic, uh, these things can be used in any of those sectors or spheres. 
um, they can be, uh, you know, th that's one of the main purposes of this. Now, within the group, you will find a power imbalance. And so this is the leadership skills that it takes to, to get that, uh, that uh, group, uh, to get the, that minority group understood and represented with the more powerful so that they can come alongside and be allies. And remember, there are many kinds of power, right? So um, one of the most overlooked, but one of the one of the greatest in use right now is people power. Multi-stakeholder processes are 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 for getting people uh, together to enhance the collective voice on something that they all care about. So does that help any Jet? Yeah. In, in theory. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And the devil's in the details, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me, uh, let me just move on to a, a, a case study about civilian protection here. And again, we'll make this uh, fairly brief uh, since our, our numbers are, are small today. So the idea of protecting civilians, why do we do this? Well, um, partly because 90% of casualties these days uh, in any kind of violent conflict are civilians. Um, and so, so this case study is about an area where civilians are really be, being uh, violated. Um, and, and so we want to form a multi-stakeholder process uh, to address the issue of uh, protecting civilians in a violent conflict. Um, there are a number of angles we could approach this from uh, and, and convince our various actors that we've identified to be a part of this. There's the moral argument. Um, and, and partly because maybe our nation state has signed international instruments um, that, that you know, adhere to some kind of civilian protection. There are legal frameworks, so this is uh, kind of works in tandem with the moral, but we do have these international instruments that, that have been signed. And so on the moral argument, we may be identifying uh, some kind of a religious group, a church, um, you know, the imams of the area, um, to, to join us because of the moral argument. With the legal argument, then, we might want lawyers or uh, the political people who understand these legal frameworks. Then there is the political. Uh, so, so who might be, uh, need some political legitimacy because uh, not protecting civilians is undermining their own governance uh, legitimacy. So then you have the political actors, which may be different than the legal folks. And then there's, of course, of course there's the strategic, right? Um, in terms of local population, they, there's the idea of winning population support. Well, who represents the population of the area? Traditional leaders. Uh, again, you might go to, to second track, uh, religious leaders. Um, you might go to the business leaders, for example, to invite to an MSP with the purpose of protecting civilians. And then you might want to hammer out a, uh, an agreement that's, that human security is the basis around which we will uh, we'll focus our efforts on, 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 on protecting civilians. Human security as opposed to hardware-based security and the security actors of military and police, right? So this is, this is part of the group formation is to agree that human security provides a broader basis, a better umbrella of uh, protection for civilians than does military. Military and police can't be everywhere at every time, but there are humans impacted and so human security ensures that security actors will always be where they need to be. So then we ask, 
well, human security, uh, I'm sorry, um, protection of civilians, how? And we've kind of answered that with our vision statement before, right? This is kind of like the vision statement of the group or the purpose statement of the group. But then we get into the weeds of the how do we do protection of civilian. So there's a monitoring of civilian harm. There's reducing threats. There's reducing civilian vulnerabilities. There's improving the protective environment. All of, if we were to, to outline each of these, now the various actors in terms of civilian protection might become even clearer. It's not that we're saying with a human security lens that police and military are not needed, no, but they have specific duties and the multi-stakeholder process will, uh, will ensure that they're, they're not trying to um, provide security where the best kinds of security are, uh, are not available. So, so we, might, uh, we might think about um, who, who might do the best in terms of monitoring. Well, in my experience in the Philippines, um, the Bantay ceasefire in Mindanao provided a civilian monitoring, an, a, a, a neutral, um, impartial monitoring of the way the ceasefire uh, was being uh, adhered to. Um, reducing threats to civilians. Again, you might have a political actor, you might have local governance, you might have um, you might even on this MSP, you might have a representative of the, the quote, rebel group. Um, and, and, and you see the, the difficulties in leading a group like that. If you have military, you have rebel groups in the same MSP. How many years would it take to develop that? Uh, and yet, without both of the buy-in, of at least buy-in of those groups, you're not going to have the kind of human security oriented protection of civilian you could get. Um, reducing civilian vulnerabilities. Here's where you might want uh, NGOs and uh, LNGOs um, to be able to uh, address the human security needs and fears and, um, and the, certainly the dignity parts of human security. Improving the protective environment. That sounds like military speak for me. Uh, and this might be the role in which the military might provide. I do want to contrast security paradigms at this point, because this is where in a multi-stakeholder process, you're going to have the security actors arguing over security approaches. I find this really striking. On the left hand, when I was teaching at higher, in higher education uh, just a year and a half ago, I used to get these, these uh, catalogs from, from textbook companies. And look at this, international affairs. It's all about weaponry. There's drones and there's armed soldiers on the cover of this thing. And I'm telling you, the books in this, in this catalog were all about hardware-based security. I don't think there was a single human security-based um, book in this catalog. If you look on the right side, this is some significant work that civilians did in a human security course I taught a few years ago at MPI. And, and, and look at the, the nuance of security based on, on conflict analysis tools that they were using. In your multi-stakeholder process, you're gonna have these two approaches. How do you as a leader take control of this and honor the approaches of each and figure out where the best use for each of the, the resources around the table is. And then, and certainly when we come to language, again, maybe the approaches have their specific language. Look, look at the contrast in terminology here. From the military term of enemy or adversary, police are dealing with criminals, Human rights people are even dealing with perpetrators, right? And, but civil society uh, calls people stakeholders. Now, it, it's not that civil society, uh, you know, lets um, perpetrators of abuse go, but they may be powerful actors who need to be dealt with 
in, in, a, in a more nuanced way than just arrest and prosecution. There, you know, it, it may be more complicated than that. But you can see already the contrast in approach to all of the actors in a given scenario. So some of the issues that need to be facilitated, and again, Jet, you know, back to your question here, this is the, the devil's in the details here, because there's a lot of hard work you have to do around the table. How do you do joint analysis when you have such different approaches to security? And remember, our, our MSP, our case study here, is around civilian protection. How do you analyze, you know, what the threats are, where the resources are, who might have ideas about what best security is provided? Coming up with a theory of change, because you have an insecure location, otherwise you wouldn't be meeting about protection of civilians. So how do you think that's all going to change? Your theory of change is really an important part of, of, uh, of working through to that group cohesiveness. And then how do you approach civilians? I'm, I'm just always fascinated with the language. I heard a military guy say once, what are these, what are these people doing in my battle space? <laughs> and the people, the local residents are saying, what are these soldiers doing in my backyard? And, and both of them were in the same space at the same time. Like, like these two approaches are so far apart. And yet, we're human security centered. We're looking at protection of civilians. Which approach do you think uh, would give most protection? The what are these civilians doing in my battle space versus what are these um, soldiers doing in my backyard? And certainly, um, this is comes from uh, the Human Security Handbook that GPAC again is freely available for a download. Um, you know, we we look at a population centric and enemy centric kind of spectrum. So, um, you know, how might our military people around the MSP table? How might they be approaching? approaching this. So, so we have to get inside and have some empathy for and understanding of each of the perspectives around the table. And again, the police um, have very much uh, this, this orientation toward com from community policing to military style policing. And unfortunately, many police around the world are, are going this hardware military style approach to policing. So we've, we've got to understand uh, those stakeholders around the table in uh, protection of civilians. But here's a model that may be around our table in uh, civilian protection. This is from the Nonviolent Peace Force. This is unarmed civilian peacekeeping and how nuanced uh, from proactive engagement, monitoring, capacity development, relationship building, how this is human first, people first oriented security. Um, and it's not that the nonviolent peace force does not liaise with uh, the militaries and police where they're located, but they really do understand um, um, what might bring the most security in a, in a given situation. Uh, we do have a few questions. I've got one more slide and then we'll, we can pick those questions up. So, um, so in terms of MSP facilitation, you can see that there are various levels with which we might want to work on our group that is convened uh, in the MSP. We might want to do some capacity building. What capacities in civilian protection might we need? Well, the military might need to understand that unarmed civilian peacekeeping really does have its place and can be more effective and, and far less inflammatory and far less expensive than the kind of security they provide. Likewise, we may need civilians to understand the military mindset. We may need to get civilians trained in order to understand um, what the reality of the soldiers in this space are. Uh, identifying the human security challenges then uh, designing human security strategies. 
So, so number two is about conflict analysis. And when you do that jointly, you come up with um, an analysis that will really support the, uh, the approach to human security. And then how do you implement these? Um, so we're getting increasing complexity, the increasing need for trust as we go around this circle here. Um, how do you get military to, to take directives from a civilian group, for example, um, in terms of strategies? And certainly number four, the implementing of those strategies. And then finally five, how do you loop back around and monitor the effectiveness of your action? So, so this is, uh, again, this is from the Human Security Handbook, um, and uh, th that is freely available if uh, you didn't get the link yesterday. All right, well, that's, that's the, the very simple case study here. Um, we do have a few questions. Uh, Lucy, I'm going to turn it back to you. Well, and maybe you want to add something on the nonviolent peace force, uh, since you're very closely connected, I'll read the questions and maybe have some responses here. Okay, well, first of all, thank you so much, John. That, you, you put things so clearly. I, I learn a great deal. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, I mean, I think the main thing with the nonviolent peace force is that it's based on relationships and relationship building. And I think this is actually one of the things that's come out across what you've been saying about multi-stakeholder processes, what Tanya was talking about yesterday and Mark, that this is, this is the crucial way in if you're looking to actually start to work for peace, you have to start with relationships. Nonviolent Peace Force specializes in being non-partisan so that they can, for instance, then be part of the civilian peace monitoring or accompanying people who, who are under threat because they're nonpartisan and they've built the relationships, that's how they can actually protect people, whether it's refugees in a camp in Iraq or uh, women in South Sudan, this is how it works. Just the trust and the respect and knowing that they can always be spoken to and be addressed. It's emphasizing the human side. The Nonviolent Peace Force even describes its work as actually sort of human security in action, which I find interesting. The, sort of the boots on the ground part of human security, if you like. So it's, it's good to have everything um, tied up. Thank you. Thank you again, John. Let's, let's go to quickly. Maria, you had a couple of questions, which maybe John has now read through. Yeah. Uh, what, what approaches in MSB could be used in protecting our military? who are casualties in many violent extremism incidents as well as terrorism. A anything else you want to add to that question, Maria? If, if not, um, let me just say, this is why military would need a multi-stakeholder process. Um, Lucy talked a lot about relationships. If the military is in an area patrolling, for example, would it not be better if the military had the trust of the local population instead of having a, a hostile local population? Um, so the military, in, in, I have some experience in Afghanistan as well, understanding that, you know, the language that comes out of that is winning hearts and minds and, and some of this old, old language. There's something to that about making your intentions in the area known. Now, you can have a local population indifferent to the military or even afraid of the military who really aren't the people who are, you know, shooting or, 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 or exploding bombs, right? If you, if you have a dialogue process to explain exactly what the objectives are. Well, how, how does a military who's a complete outside force gain any kind of trust at all, especially given the power imbalance between the two groups, local populations and military, right? Some kind of a multi-stakeholder process. And, and the entry point that I found in, in a lot of military is the CIMIC people, the civ, the CIV mill people. 
there's a certain percentage of those soldiers whose job it is to engage local, local populations. Those are the people who best understand the, the realities of uh, being in a space like that and the vulnerabilities. Well, a multi-stakeholder process might be able to expand that and really the military may achieve their objectives without even having soldiers in the area if there's enough trust if there's a a, a multi-stakeholder process that gives them the assurance at least these threats aren't coming from this or that area right how do you get to that it it it's a lot of work it's a lot of trust building. It takes some neutral parties who are able to shuttle between, because certainly local leaders aren't gonna wanna be seen, uh, especially if there's a lot of abuses. They're not gonna wanna be seen with local militaries or local militias who, who are actually you know, in active combat, right? So this is very complicated, but it takes, I think it takes civil society to kind of convene some of these things because there's access to various levels. And we could go into the analysis of, uh, uh, you know, the pyramid, for example. It's the middle out actors who have access to grassroots and upper layer leadership. So um, I hope that, that, um, that gave a little bit of insight, but you know, this is long drawn out work. And I think Tanya, yesterday yeah. you said three years of process. Um, so, um, yeah, they aren't quick, uh, but, but okay, Maria, I see you have your, your mic unmuted. You want to follow up? Yeah. Yeah, 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 John, I, uh, we do understand. Uh, here in the Philippines, uh, our military has started uh, organizing a multi-stakeholder uh, multi groups or bodies within the commands. However, in fighting, uh, for the, in fighting terrorism, uh, we have engaged in a lot of discussions already. We have programs to somehow uh, ask rebel, the rebels to, to go back to the government. However, it's, it's such a complicated thing when politics come in because many, uh, many, some politicians, maybe or not all, are using these armed groups, are using this uh EPA and DF, including the Abu Sayyaf, including the MILF, uh, own, uh, recall this, their own uh, uh, vested interest. So in, yeah. in having MSPs, I don't know if GPAC has, a, yeah, I don't know if GPAC has really an inventory or a monitoring of all this, uh, from money laundering to uh, arms to uh, somehow, of course, uh, really an, an, an in-depth assessment or an in-depth uh, identification of how these uh, processes work out. Can it be done by multi-sectoral multi processes or MSPs? Because uh, we have been uh, working on really for peace, but somehow it seems like peace is rather very evasive. So, yeah. So I, I, I'm from the multi-sectoral advisory board, uh, John. So yeah, good. that's why we're doing Great. a lot of work too. Yeah, yeah. And you know how complicated and how multi-layered these things are. And, um, you know, I, I remember sitting with General Ferrer, you know that name, um, uh, back in maybe more, more than a decade ago in Basilan, in Isabella, and, yes. and talking with him about, yeah. and, you know, and, and him saying, well, I, I know my power, I know kind of, I, I know that I, the very minimum, I will not be used by politicians. So I'm going to professionalize the military in such a way that um, I'll, I'll not be used by politicians. Well, that came out of dialogue with, with civil society leaders, right? And, and, and his position on that. Now, it's, it's more complicated than that, but, but I remember it thinking, well, that was a capacity um, that in some kind of a dialogue, and can you imagine if, if that is a sustained dialogue, how uh, people interacting in their own leadership roles with other leaders from other sectors uh, might begun, begin to um, 
you know, kind of change the, the, the culture within their own sectors and organizations. Um, I, I want to pick up also this, this question about organized crime from Jet. Now, it's, it's interesting because I remember a case from Los Angeles, I, I think it's Los Angeles, where, um, no, no, it might be Chicago actually, where you had gang leaders and the gangs were at war with each other. Now this isn't, this isn't directly, this is organized crime is a little bit more complex here. But th they developed a, a community multi-stakeholder process and started to invite the gang leaders in to figure out what their needs and perspective is. And they took a lot of flack from local leaders, right? From, from political leaders to uh, even some civic leaders. Why are you inviting these gangs in? But it, but it resulted in greater human security because the gangs stopped fighting when some of these uh, spats were me mediated between the, the gangs. And kind of the, some of the criminal behavior they were involved in, they realized that it was only a few perpetrators of, of most of the violent incidents. And when the gangs were able to rein their own, their own um, uh, you know, the, the ones who were doing most of the violence in, then, then there was, a, there was a, a much greater human security. So the thing about civil society and calling everybody a stakeholder, regardless of, of what kind of role they have in a conflict, is that you don't, you don't eliminate their, um, their participation automatically by your language. Which, which so many, so many groups automatically assume things about other groups. And again, this is complicated and there could be some justification for some of those labels. On the other hand, I, I remember, you know, the, the US was trying to convene peace talks in Afghanistan, but consistently the international community, in fact, consistently refuse to invite the Taliban. Well, how are you going to have any peace, right? Because they were labeled terror, terrorists, there was no way to approach the Taliban for, for inclusion. And so it took, it took civic leaders to say, look, let's neutralize the language, even though you know, there may, there's a lot of harm on all sides here. How do we get to even begin to, to do this shuttle diplomacy so that we can pull a process together that might address that? So that's the uh, the thought. Jet, do you have any any thoughts there or any follow ups with uh, with that question of yours on organized crime? Yeah, I think I think quite often the difficulty is that you it's like a cloud. I don't have. It's so difficult to get an analysis to know right. who um, you have to talk to if you want to. to I think at this point, we're not like in a multi-stakeholder process right now, but even for your analysis, it's so difficult to know because people are not talking. And um, uh, that's, that's fear. So there is fear. And then it's, 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 it's not, um, it's very difficult to get like an analysis. It's, it's nice to have like a big analysis about different cartels and things but how it's working in a in in a small community or on a much smaller basis that's very hard like as an international peace and observation organization we always say that you have to make responsible the government for because they have to provide like a, a a situation that there is no that much violence, but they sometimes even don't know to those places. So you, you really, where, where there is a lot of conflict. So it's it's, I think right now, uh, for me the difficulty is that I don't have a, a clear analysis about what's going on. And if you don't have that, you cannot even talk to anyone because you don't have, you don't know to whom you have to talk. And that that's that's I think. Um, uh, uh, the really, really difficult part right now in, in here in Chiapas 
to know who is who and what power does and someone have and that makes it and then you go clearly you got to talk to the, the the priest or the or the people you think that might have more information but right now i think that's the most difficult part that i don't have a clear analysis about what's going on yeah and and i think you you've identified the key question in the who who do i go to who knows about this <laughs> and 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 with an incomplete analysis you might not even know who knows which different areas or sectors um and and the analysis you do will certainly be incomplete you know the, the ultimate hope for a multi-stakeholder process in doing conflict analysis is that you a complete picture emerges even if not everybody agrees on that picture because isn't part of the conflicts we're involved in that 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 perspectives have been left out and that leaving out leads to terrorism it leads to uh you know de despondency and and secondary violence uh and internalized violence and, and internalized kind of a feeling of, of repression and so um getting to that point where voices are heard even if in this microcosm of a multi-stakeholder process that may be a long-term goal. It may be a decadal goal, right? Because these conflicts are decadal in, in nature. So let's not assume that we can pull multi-stakeholder process together in a year or so. But, but what is the vision for uh, the, the next step? What is the long-term vision? And then what's the next step to get to, to start to work toward that vision. That, that's the role of peace building. And I just wanna share something I've been toying around with, how all of these concepts fit together. And I'd be interested if, uh, if this has any relevance. So I'm gonna pull this together, let's see, F5 and share my screen. Um, why can't, oh, am I still sharing my screen? Can you see my screen? Okay. Yes, yes. So, so the question is, how does it all fit together? Well, we have these storm clouds that blow in and that's conflict, right? Now, in, in the idea of conflict transformation, conflict is neutral. It's neither good nor bad. It's an energy and we can harness energy. But what happens is the choices for violence are made. And so, we, so that these storm clouds develop these floods of violence. And of course, human security gets trounced. It gets damaged when these floods happen. Uh, want, fear, indignity, trauma happens, right? And these floods threaten to wash people away. Relief and development moves in in some of these, uh, during some of these floods and provides a solid place to stand on. But it's not, it's not the end all and be all, but it is critical, especially in want, right? If you have a humanitarian emergency, uh, you, you, you wanna get food and water and shelter in, in places like that. Human security though, provides that umbrella under which the people stand. And, and that is working at freedom from fear, freedom from uh, want, freedom and, and uh, freedom from indignity. Um, Peace building is what expands that umbrella of human security to provide more and more long-term solutions and, and people-centric kinds of, you know, it's, whether it's relationship building, whether it's uh, the task of peace building. And sometimes we have to step out and we have to do our conflict analysis and we have to say, well, so what's going on here in this storm? Conflict transformation is, is building that garden that channels and absorbs these floodwaters, right? And, and we're trying to grow something beautiful. So conflict transformation is taking all that energy uh, after violence is reduced and, and, and growing the garden. And nonviolence is, is part of what is the modality with which uh, you know, these, these waters of violence are, are dried up 
and, and provide our, our garden of conflict transformation to grow. And, you know, through this all, we have to maintain this vision of hope that, that all of this, uh, these floodwaters will, will be dried up and the next storm will not cause a violence, a flood of violence, but, but will be an appropriate amount of rain. Uh, Nonviolence providing that, that uh, brilliance all the way along. Anyways, it's just something I've been working on because I've been struggling with, how does all this stuff fit together? You know, we use all these words, we use all of these terms and we have all of these frameworks. How does it fit together? Does this make sense to anybody or am I like way off base here? I think it's beautiful actually, I'm, I'm thinking about it. But <laughs> it's lovely. But I'm wondering, Jet, you know, or, or Maria, both of you are kind of, you know, in the, in the, down in the dirty here. Does this, does this give you any insights or does it, does it actually confuse uh, the world more? Anyways. No, yeah, no, I, th mm -hmm. I, I think it makes it makes sense. I'm not sure if it is all, um, how you say, organized in that way, but maybe <laughs> conflict. It's also like what is what's the framework you're working from? I think we work more from trend, conflict transformation than human security, but both are so interconnected that. Um, <laughs> Um, well, I think it's 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 very well. It's at least more like one picture where you see all of it. Thank you. I think it's really nice. And, uh, you know, conflict transformation is a is a fundamental framework, right? If we believe conflict is neutral, right, and and that it's the choices that are made. Sometimes they're default choices, like people just jump right into hitting back or violence, right? But if we step back and say, well, how do we how do we uh, hesitate in that moment of knee-jerk reaction of, of hitting back or violence uh, and really see that there's a lot of raw material here. It's, it's both physical, like physical body, right? When we're under stress, but some people live under that all the time, but, it's a, but, but conflict is a raw material. What would happen if we channel that? toward greater trust and, you know, better relationships and more conflict carrying capacity. That's kind of the vision I have for, for conflict transformation. And it is, you know, but, but gardens get washed away by violence. And so we understand that a lot of the work we've done, I think of, about Mindanao where I've spent so long, you know, th there were gains made and then all of a sudden there was just, just washed away by this flood of violence again. That, that, seemed to be cyclical there for a while, every three years, right? Well, you notice that it's kind of stretched out, and, but it's, it's really, the violence has kind of morphed as well. And so, you know, anyways, yeah, enough of that. Um, I noticed there were some other questions. The abuse of MSPs by politicians uh, with a tendency of capitalizing human rights. Yeah, it's, this this discussion of justice, for example, human rights advocates are really justice oriented, and and justice is a big injustice is a big part of indignity and of course fear, right? And yet, so one of the th things we do in training is the the justice, peace, mercy, and truth fishbowl, right? To understand that if those things aren't all balanced then justice, all of the wars of the 20th century were prosecuted on, on the basis of justice. So justice alone does not give us the human security we need. And in designing a multi-stakeholder process, again, that's one of the things you may have to, um, you have to manage, right? Is a lot of these powerful actors who come with an agenda, well, maybe they're not the right who to have at your multi-stakeholder process if the agenda is so bullheaded, and yet if they're critical actors, then you gotta find a way to build the listening capacities in, stepping back away from, from the polarizing issues. Uh, but again, you know, the strategic who 
is really a, a strategic um, part of, of pulling an MSP together. Um, okay, where are we time-wise? Okay, we're, we're okay. So, John, I, I wanted to add to, to your picture. I think that it is beautiful and it, 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 it explains the, the process very well. Uh, I would somehow add time somewhere because these processes last for for long and actually they 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 are eternal if I may say <laughs> they it does not stop because uh, that is from my small experience in, in comparison to yours and um, also in addition to that they they last for many reasons uh, because of the nature of the conflict because of geopolitics. Uh, uh, because of politicians or decision makers actually who are becoming ruthless all over the world. I have to say that the 21st century is completely uncomparable uh, with the, at least 20th century because there are many vested interests of uh, big powers, big co corporations. So it is not only uh, up to one government. That's, that's the, the trouble, if I may mm -hmm. say. So we, we have to, to take all these um, powerful actors when we think about uh, power and, and time. So what do we do in uh, our local communities? We, uh, the only choice that we have is to keep on going and to keep on uh, <clears throat> working with local population on, on building resilience, on involving them in different types of processes, on simply not giving up because that is not the choice. But can we tackle all these uh, complex uh, uh, problems? I'm not so sure. Uh, we, we can do that up to the certain point, to, to the certain level of uh, the uh, pyramids. And then maybe plan, as, as you uh, nicely put in the picture, plan for, for some other period uh, where, where this hope is and uh, build our capacities meanwhile, be, build strength uh, among people and so on. So th that is complexity, but I want to, first of all, I want to stress that all these processes take time and uh, that may, may really last uh, for a long time with some small changes uh, that, that are happening. And even those changes are significant for population. Because without civil society or without, well, without power of people, then I'm not sure what would happen. I, I think that almost everything positive will stop. So that's the only way to continue. Yeah. But I, I will stop here. We can talk about that for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Tanya. That's, that's helpful. Yeah, how do you add uh, time? How do you understand time? And uh, and these powerful interests. Those are those are questions. I think, you know, each MSP has to kind of face each each convening, and um, and and to your the first part of your point, um, understanding the original peace building 1.0 was a set of skills, whereas peace building 2.0 was figured out that that it was there's a lot of sectors to be brought to this discussion. <laughs> And peace building 3.0 now, we understand that we have to think at a systems level and we have to build peace in at every sector. And it's not just a professionalized activity, but it's, it's a culture of peace. And of course, that word has been floating around for a long time. But a culture of peace means that everything is infused with the, you know, the capacities of, con of transforming conflict, is understanding their contribution to um, you know, the world we want, right? The greater common good. And, and these are wicked problems, um, mm. very interconnected in a way that, and, and they seem overwhelming. You know, when the U.S. spends 80, $800 billion a year on armaments, you know, on its military, that just seems overwhelming. How do you go up against that much yeah. money every year that has vested interest in hardware-based security? When, when, you know, NGOs and peace organizations are just starving to death. And, you know, where's the hope in that? Except that you said, Tanya, we just, we keep going. We keep um, moving ahead. So, yeah. So I think, um, 
Does anyone have a burning question? I, there's been a lot going through the chat here. I haven't been able to keep up. Um, Some of it was just asking opinions, actually, John. Okay. Everyone, everyone is very happy with the, the workshops. But I don't see any burning questions. That's a horrific number you brought up just there, $800 billion. Well, yeah. and you know, the Institute of economics for peace is telling us that the every year the world wastes 14 trillion dollars on violence and conflict I, and i call that wasting because imagine if we had those resources flipped around for uh, for the greater common good for clean water in the want for you know for human security in the fear um, and, you know, for, for dignity for all. Oh, my goodness. So, so there's the opportunity, right? Do we want to form an MSP around the opportunity of how much low-hanging fruit we could get if we eliminated violence? My own state of Pennsylvania in the U.S. was carrying a 14, it was carrying a $4 billion deficit. Uh, maybe I'm not getting the numbers right. But anyways, I figured out that our, our own state deficit, just by reducing violence, and the only indicator of that was the reduced incarceration, would wipe that budget out, that budget shortfall out in a year. <laughs> so just reducing violence by 25%, and its only metric is incarceration. It's like, there's a lot of hope there. Like, this seems doable, doesn't it? <laughs> anyways. Yeah. Yeah, you you give us hope. Actually, it's a terrific note to end this on with your your graphic and and the hope rainbow over the top of it and um, <laughs> the opportunity. How can we get together and pull everyone across the globe into an MSP towards uh, better human security for all? Thank you so much, John. It's really been an inspiring three days. Well, and thank, thank you, you all for, thank you for facilitating and, and Christina for the background work on Zoom. Tanya yeah. for your case study. Um, I've, and, and all of you who have joined us uh, today or multiple times, we appreciate your, all the work you're doing around the world to, to make it a better place.